So hello everyone, uh, welcome to the panel on what's next in India. I am Manish Singhal. I'll uh, uh, moderate the session. Uh, just a quick background myself. I am founding partner at Pi Ventures. We are a venture fund uh, started four and a half years ago. Uh, we focus uh, on India, of course, but uh, also we are very focused on the deep tech. And within deep tech, we are actually specialized in artificial intelligence. Uh, we do seed investments. We've done 11 investments so far uh, and very keenly watching the space uh, of not just AI, but other forms of deep tech as well as uh, they are making uh, their way into the uh, mainstream uh, industries. Uh, today in the session, uh, we have a very interesting panel and uh, uh, also a very interesting topic, right? Because given the scenario that we are living in today, several uh, things are happening. India has always been a land of opportunities, uh, in, but in the given times, you know, the ch things that we are seeing changing uh, with COVID around us, uh, recent uh, um, massive amount of funding that GEO has raised and what that uh, means for the Indian ecosystem, how exits are going to shape up uh, in the coming uh, future, et cetera, et cetera. So we're going to talk about a host of different things and see how India is positioned to take uh, you know advantage of of the situation we are in but before we uh, kick that on i think it's uh, it's good to get uh, introduced to all of our speakers today uh, so i will uh, i'll ask all three of you to go one by one and introduce yourself maybe aram we can start with you since your name starts with a thank you manish uh, so i'm anand lonia i uh, am a general partner at india quotient we, we are a seed stage VC for investing half a million to $2 million in uh, primarily paper stage uh, companies in the, in the tech space in India, uh, sector agnostic. Uh, uh, many of our investments have been like, you know, ahead of time. Uh, we, uh, we currently manage $60 million and have an opportunities fund on top of that. Uh, usually the three, three general partners, and usually we make uh, two, three deals each. Uh, you will you will recognize us by this company called ShareChat, which is positioned to take uh, the place of uh, TikTok in India, popular in the local newspapers. All right, thank you, Anand. Ruchira, you want to go next? Sure, Manish. Uh, I'm Ruchira Shukla, and I lead the South Asia business for disruptive technologies for IFC, which is a division of the World Bank Group. Uh, we do direct equity investing in startups as well as venture capital funds. We generally entered startups in their series B or later stages, although we've, did, we've done earlier stage investments in markets like Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. And uh, in VC funds, we focus more on the tech-oriented funds that are aligned with our own sector strategy. Thank you, Ruchira. Sandeep? Hi, thanks, Nish. Uh, I'm a partner at Lightbox. Uh, we are managing our third fund currently, which is about a $200 million fund. We invest in tech and tech-enabled businesses. Uh, we have a very concentrated approach, so our funds only invest in about eight companies per cycle. And, um, and we continue to look for how tech is going to make a difference and change, uh, change different industries. So happy to talk more about that as we go. Sure. Uh, thanks, Andeep. Uh, I think to kick off, right, we, we probably need to sort of address the elephant in the room probably in all panel discussions around COVID. So let me just uh, get that out of the way and then we will talk about other things. Uh, so I think we all know how COVID has changed our lives. I think uh, apart from Anand, I think all of us are at home uh, working uh, uh, very differently than uh, what we used to be. And consumer behavior is also changing massively. Uh, portfolio founders have had their own challenges and how to kind of deal with this. So maybe I, I can bring in Ruchira so you bring in a very interesting uh, perspective, Ruchira, because you not only invest directly, but also invest through your funds. So, uh, you know, you probably have seen various uh, startups through consumer, through deep tech, etc. So what in your mind or in your experience COVID has done for the startups positively and negatively and how have the founders uh, taken advantage or not taken advantage of this? Definitely, lots of examples to share, but um, you know, certain sectors had a lot of cold, uh, a lot of tailwind because of uh, COVID. 
right? Because people realize they just couldn't step out. Markets are closed. You're not, you know, you're not safe stepping out to markets or to public transportation or even go out and meet people, right? So that changed the way people did stuff. It changed the way people bought stuff. Um, and the tailwind sectors are definitely e-grocery. So for us, Big Basket saw a, a surge in its volumes. Uh, in fact, they have been delivering an average of over 300,000 orders on a daily basis. And in the month of July, they did over 10 million orders. A similar business that we invested in in Bangladesh called Chal Dal is another e-grocery platform saw a 7x increase in their volumes. Now, we do believe that some of this change that we've seen is fundamental and is here to stay because people who are first-time transactors on the net and were forced to transact online because they couldn't step out and go to their markets are now going to be here to stay because they have now gradually become comfortable in this new way of operating. Some of it may slip back, but a large part of it will stay. And I think that has therefore taken India at least three to five years ahead in the internet transacting um, sort of curve that we were expecting to see. The other sector which COVID has given a whole tailwind to is health tech. Uh, and it's just like we weren't comfortable going to markets, nobody's comfortable walking into a pharmacy, nobody's comfortable walking into a lab for a test. And things like teleconsultations, e-pharmacy, e-diagnostic marketplaces, all of those are now taking off in a big way. And we are one, we are, we are, we are one MG in our portfolio, which uh, we are proud to see has grown very well uh, in the current market circumstance. The other players that did well uh, were those that could pivot well and could use this crisis as an opportunity to reinvent what they were doing. So Bizongo um, is another B2B player in our, um, in our portfolio that, was, uh, that actually as its core is a B2B packaging marketplace. But they have a, a number of supplier relationships, about 30,000 suppliers, and they were quickly able to identify those suppliers that could manufacture PPE kits. And they repurposed textile manufacturers for PPE kit manufacturing and in the last few months have delivered over 250,000 PPE kits. So it actually brought out strengths in management teams when, it, when they were managing either a surge in volume because of the, of the tailwind or they were thinking about how to reorient their business. We also saw some, some businesses see a lot of headwind, right? Ride hailing, ride, as, ride sharing, all of those businesses suffered uh, and we saw that again for same similar reasons nobody wants to use a shared asset anymore because they're fearful of getting infected wherever uh, we saw a drop in top line management teams had to tighten their belts and think about cost management and that has made entrepreneurs very focused on uh, being cash conscious extending their cash runways founders have taken salary cuts uh, some of them have had to lay off, and that also is a big lesson for people. So in terms of the future, I think people will be a lot more measured in how they grow. And so fundamentally, this crisis has been an opportunity in yeah. making people stronger as, as management teams. So, sure. Thanks, Richard. I think uh, one of the takeaways that I'm getting from your um, uh, answer is that India always had a lot of people, right? We had 1 billion, 1.3 billion people plus. But how many of how of their uh, transact online, buy online, etc. And COVID has probably given an acceleration to that whole piece uh, in a massive way, which could have taken probably five years to get all those folks online. Already, people are getting online yeah. in massive portions. Yeah. And I think that's a good point to bring Anand in. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, recently Geo raised almost fifteen billion dollars, which was like a massive, yeah. massive amount by any uh, yeah. any uh, yardstick. And uh, and with their uh, whole geo platform, obviously expecting uh, you know millions of Indians coming online again. So uh, how do you see this whole thing play out for the India market uh, from consumer perspective, from uh, investing perspective, um, and, and you know general ecosystem perspective? Now that's super, uh, Manish. Uh, Last 10 years, right, we, we saw the formation of uh, Flipkart and, and Flipkart eventually the founders exited. Right? We saw the creation of Swiggy, uh, before that Make My Trip and, and a lot of companies which have global parallels. Right? These are globally successful models which were brought into India, you know, you have Ola, Uber, all of these companies. Uh, but but last three, four years, these companies have sort of plateaued. They're not growing at 100-20% a year, last three, four years. Right? Uh, neither are the valuations, they, are, they still continue to burn, interestingly, all of these models. 
but uh, next 10 years right will be about not just the top 10% or maybe 5% indians maybe 50 million indians that these companies are catering to uh, i mean how many people can afford e-commerce right uh, what geo is doing is at a price point of 2 dollars a month right? they are bringing in 500 million indians to the table and this will create unique to india opportunities right? with with a very low arpu and and companies uh, in the next 10 years will have to solve for very low arpu also right? maybe ad driven maybe maybe you know uh, 1 dollars a month kind of a cost right i'll give you an example of a non startup just to sort of you know make my point hotstar has 300 million subscribers right? it's a tv app out of 300 million i think 10 million are paid but the payment is just 15 dollars a year that's like one and a half dollars uh, or less than that a month right now as compared to netflix at 10 dollars plus plus right a uh, 10 12 dollars uh, similarly gmail for example uh, enterprises and small businesses had to use gmail at 12 to 17 dollars i mean manish you are paying and sandeep is paying the bills for the for their teams right it's reasonably expensive Gmail for the first time has recently launched a a one point five dollars a month plan only for India, only new subscribers. We can't, so yeah, you can't go and save money on a Gmail subscription. Yeah. But but the point is that you know how, there are so many Indian businesses, including CA firms and legal firms and all people yeah. with twenty people, fifty people don't have a company email ID because it's just too expensive. Right? We need Indian solutions at low ARPU, uh, which you have talked about healthcare. Right? Nothing has happened in healthcare because. Because India is a unique country. There are no global companies in healthcare, right? I mean, every Western country, even China, the state provides healthcare, right? Uh, insurance is provided by the state. There is state-provided pension. So financial services are again savings are all taken by care of the state. Education is a state subject again. So you you don't do B two C education, right? Baidu is a unique Indian company uh, because because selling to only Indians, right? Uh, you will not find global parallels. I think Reliance Geo platforms will spawn a a genre of companies which is uniquely Indian and mm-hmm. which will not necessarily have a lot of global competition, which is good. I'm looking forward to some capital efficient companies, looking forward to some IPOs. And I think, yeah. I think geo platform lays the, the, not just geo platforms actually, Manish, uh, we have, we have, uh, the, the entire India stack, including the social security numbers, UPI as a payment ecosystem. I mean, for example, in India to make a low ARPU work, you also need free payment system, free till payments, right? Which is what we have. So everything is ready and new companies are coming out. Dream 11, which is an Indian company in the gaming space actually has done extremely well because you know, a low pop, you can actually bet, take a like 50 cent bet or maybe even 10 cent bet, right? And that's the size of the bets you can take and the company is worth more than a few billion dollars now. And that's what I'm looking forward to with the geo platform. Sure. Interesting, actually. So if if one has to solve for such a low price point, right, I mean, technology has probably got a very big role to play. Otherwise, uh, you know, businesses will lose money in this whole process. Uh, yes, you can't yeah. throw throw people at this, right? You, <laughs> this can't throw people at it. you have to have a tech solution only. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So Sandeep, uh, you since you are a tech enabled fund, would you have some comments on how technology can play a role in the coming few years and what can it do for India? Sure. Uh, well, Manish, we, we, we definitely don't go at the tech the way you do. And I know you're uh, at the much more frontier edge of it. Oh, and I think absolutely. that when we, when we look at stuff, we're really looking at the application of it. And um, I think that, you know, there's different types of risks that you can take in different markets. And uh, I think in general in India, we don't take big technology risks. You are great. I'm, I'm so happy to see that there are funds that are actually uh, predicated on finding really deep tech solutions to problems. But reality is we're not one of them. And we instead look at the world and say, okay, do we believe the tech is kind of there? And then is the market evolving? And I think to Alan's point, you know, unique Indian solutions and unique Indian problems are really where we, we try to find opportunity. Alan's an investor with us and, and before us even in uh, Rebel Foods. And uh, I think that's a great example of applying tech to an industry that actually, yeah, it's not rocket science, the tech. It's just that you saw fragmentation in a food model that said that they're just not scaled to us. Rent ratios are really high in India. Uh, rent to sales ratios are out of whack. Massive failure in restaurants to begin with. And so therefore you see a structure where a cloud kitchen business can emerge. And because of the lack of incumbents in India, that business can scale up. Now what's even more exciting, uh, um, coming to kind of the, the idea of things that can be done right and done well 
a business like Rebel, the wastage in their business is somewhere between one to two percent. The industry average for a restaurant is somewhere between eight to ten percent. So this is where you can start to see that okay, if I leverage technology effectively, I can make a a, a social difference, which is nice, but actually it's a great P and L difference, um, which allows you to then have better margins, which allows you to pay back faster. All those great things that come along with that. So I think that. COVID, and to, to Ruggiero's earlier point as well, has been an accelerant. And uh, I think it's an accelerant for trends that were already moving. And mm. you see that across verticals. And I think that adoption of tech was a trend that was already happening. And it's, uh, you know, I would say that perhaps two big accelerants that we've seen. One was the, the millions of dollars of discounts that got poured into e-commerce through 2015, 14, 16, that, that time frame. And, and this right now, honestly. And, and I think that... Uh, you know, we'll come out of this and we'll see that there was already a, a changing of the guard that was happening where, you know, there was a shift among consumers towards being open to and aware of. In the June quarter of last year was the first quarter where smartphones outpaced feature phones and sales. So you saw that, and there was a, a, a quarter, I remember last year, where there was a big talk about Britannia sales were down and FMCG products are, are not selling at the same levels. And okay, they weren't, but smartphones were still selling. People valued the idea of connectivity and getting access to services, I think, more than a biscuit. And so as a result, you have this, this shift that's taken place. And I think that that's the opportunity in front of all of us right now. Um, Manish, you'll build the, the tech that will kind of mature over time. You know, Anand will come in and, and, and get it going. And then Richard and I can hopefully come help uh, grow them over time. And, and I think right among here, I'm, we I'm have the whole ecosystem. I'm going to pass on my companies to, to Sandeep. You know, he's the guy who's making the most money for me. So... Yeah, cool. <laughs> we have a very mutually beneficial ecosystem here, all right on the panel. No, which is a uh, good point, Manish. You know, just sorry to interject. Uh, I think the Indian ecosystem has developed beautifully, Manish. Right? Mm -hmm. You know, we are we are seeing uh, funds collaborating, funds helping each other, and yeah. uh, it, you know, this was was sort of you know evolved into really strong relationships between people over the last ten years. And I think, sure. uh, and, and people like you are specializing, right? Which is sort of evolution of the ecosystem is happening right now. True, true. That's true. And I would like to add to that, Sandeep, when I, talk, um, when I, when I think about people collaborating, uh, you know, the best time to see the collaboration come through is in a time of crisis. And what COVID showed us is how investors got together, where they felt the asset was strong, but perhaps this was not the time to get external money because maybe the valuation would not be the best. Yeah. Given this, the pinch that COVID did to the business, investors put together bridge rounds. Wherever they, they thought that this was the right time to extend the runway, right? And wherever they thought there was some kind of convertible required, venture debt came in or convertibles were done. So every instrument was explored to help the companies extend their runway in this time of crisis. And that's what actually, you know, it's like the proof is in the pudding. How do you work together when things are not going so well? Uh, and so I think it's more than just collaboration you know, in good times, is how they've done this through the crisis. Sure. I actually wanted to bring up one point, right? India has always been criticized uh, for one thing that we don't have enough exits in the system. And pretty much, uh, you know, money comes in, but hardly money goes out. Uh, and compared to the paying uh, capacity, as Anand, you said that, you know, uh, the ARPUs will go massively low than the rest of the world. Obviously, we can solve with tech to still make the businesses run. But uh, any would want any one of you want to comment on how exits are shaping up currently and how does it look in the next uh, coming decade? You know, I, I, I can start. Um, yeah. I, I can start on this. Because, you know, it's a... Uh, I think Anand also alluded to the fact that we've been in businesses that have burnt lots of money here. And I think that if you kind of look in general at the market, we've been a very capital inefficient uh, uh, market in terms of how businesses have scaled. And I think that that's, I mean, partially fueled as well by investor appetite and mindset to say, look, if we can grab as much market share as possible, let's grow and we'll work it out and we'll figure it out. And, and you know, the, the story kind of played in other markets, namely, let's say China to an extent where it, it happened. And I think that, as obvious as it may seem, um, the realization that India is not the U.S. and India is not China has taken some time to, to kind of dawn upon everyone and, and realize that, okay, we're, we're going to have to perhaps scale and grow differently. Uh, I can tell you that looking at the world today, actually, I'll give you a, a good example on the other side. We have had businesses that have grown the way, let's say, a logical company could grow in InfoEdge, 
um, which we were investors in just prior to the IPO and then we exited afterwards. But I was talking to them recently and, and I'm, I, while we've all talked about uh, GEO and the amount of capital they've raised, InfoEdge did a 200 million QIP uh, over one week on Zoom calls. And, you know, they have the capacity to both have created an exit, are extremely well valued, um, have been able to garner follow-on capital into the business in a time of crisis based on just being really smart, stable uh, executors of a proposition that they've outlined very clearly. So I think that what's going to happen over the coming years is you now have businesses of scale. When InfoEdge went public, they were doing $20 million in revenue. Today you have companies that are private that are doing north of $100 million in revenue. They just don't have the same unit economics yet. And I think that while the, like I said, the dot-com, the 2014-16 dot boom fueled growth through discounts and, and losses, I think that the growth that's coming now at this point in time is coming with very solid unit economics. And I mm -hmm. think that that should position companies over the coming 18 to 24 months to be in a position where they are exceeding their pre-COVID levels, they are growing at healthy rates, and ideally are growing profitably. Because the, the fundamental premise of tech investing was that if I can invest in the platform once and drive not one transaction but 100,000 transactions, I get leverage, which means I can grow my earnings exponentially. Now, somehow along the journey of the last 20, 30 years of tech investing globally, that notion of growing earnings has kind of dissipated and said I can grow eyeballs, I can grow GMV, I can grow different topics. But I think slowly we're starting to recognize, and, and you saw it pre-COVID with the, the IPOs of a bunch of DTC companies in the U.S. that were very poorly received based on the fact that people just weren't buying into lifetime value of, of different customers in different segments. So I, I think that we, we have bookmarks that we've given out at, at, at different points of the year where we say this time is different. I said it in 2005, I said it in 2015, I said it in 2018. I'm going to say it again. This time is different. And I do believe that the unit economics combined with the acceleration of adoption and the scale that certain companies have achieved are going to allow for one IPO to happen and second, hopefully M&A to take place. Sure. Uh, so one point to add, Manish. Uh, yeah, please. Yes, now, I was giving a slightly different perspective, an LP's perspective, because we also do invest in VC funds. And, um, you know, given that our audience might include a lot of LPs, I just wanted to give another thought. Sometimes LPs do, you know, focus rightly on DPI and VC funds therefore believe that they should show the DPI. But there's a delicate balance there because sometimes I find that funds that are too focused on showing the DPI because they want the LP to come back in their next fund might prematurely monetize. And mm -hmm. India is a market that has slightly longer gestation period than others. So I, I would advise LPs and we as LPs think about it as it's a longer term game because A, you will have to grab that market, which is not already an online transactor. Then you need to build it into a, into a model that is unit economics positive for all the segments that you're going after. And that takes time as Sandeep was saying. And yes, it's, just, it's different this time. It's stronger this time. But in order for that to come through, it will take a good few years. So as LPs, we tell our GPs that exit or monetize when the time is right. Don't do it too soon just because you want to show a DPI, because then you're leaving money on the table. And that's a delicate balance we want them to strike. Manish, Anam, the era of global competition and copying global models where uh, you, you start an Ola here and Uber will come and compete with you. You start a Flipkart here and Amazon will come and compete with you. That era is probably over. Mm -hmm. uh, the new models that are coming up now will be more in healthcare, more in education, more in financial services. And these will be reasonably well regulated, reasonably unique to India. And in general, VCs are anyways cognizant about the fact that they have to create value. Uh, I think VCs, when I talk around to people, we all want to now create institutions. We want companies which will go to IPO and, and remain. Nobody is now thinking in terms of, okay, can I burn, burn a lot, you know, grow, grow fast and sell out to somebody? We're not thinking like that. Right? Uh, there have been a lot of secondaries also, by the way, right? mm -hmm. which also shows that people, people are taking a long view, like what you said. And, and with a long view, they will, you, you just have to create long standing institutions and secondaries will come along. Even if IPOs will take time. Right? Uh, I, I do hope, you know, when I talk to other people in Sequoia and Excel, they're all, all gunning for IPO, right? And that sort of will drive the behavior of how some of these companies will, will behave probably, you know, once they go past series C or D, uh, that should change, right? Which is a good, good sign. 
I, I also think that competition intensity is also reducing by the government sort of taking some steps, you know, as you've seen in some sectors, right? uh, which is good because because unnecessarily competitive markets are not necessarily good for returns uh, for VCs, right? Because it just spoils the economics of the companies. I think we have a few minutes left in the session and um, I have one thought which I would love actually each one of you to comment on, right? Uh, you know, the global uh, winds uh, have kind of, uh, for lack of a better word, gone anti-China a little bit uh, on the sentiment side uh, from investment perspective, from doing business perspective. Uh, India is, uh, uh, is a place where uh, there is a lot of tech talent. There is a lot of people uh, out here, uh, which uh, which can participate in the economy in different ways. Uh, I would love each one of you to share your perspective. Are are we as Indians uh, poised well to take uh, real good advantage of this situation? And is there a situation to take advantage of? Right. So both probably in any order. Yeah. Please. All right. Um, I'm happy to take it first. Uh, so I, I, can't, I recently, uh, last year, read the book AI Superpowers by Kai Fu Lee, and he talked about what China did when they met their moment where they really felt that they were falling behind in the, the world of AI. And the concerted effort across government, uh, investors, entrepreneurs, to really bridge that gap. And I'm not talking just at a, a central level, at the municipal level, to facilitate space, connectivity, access, everything just insane. And the pace at which they caught up in, the, that, in the, the field of AI was just shocking. And Manisha, this is more your world than mine. But uh, I, I just imagine that the requirement to, to be able to really get things going is a massive requirement uh, to, to really bridge the gap from where we sit today. So mm -hmm. as much as I'd like to say that, you know, on some of the, the more cutting edge or even future forward looking things, which is where I think it counts more. I mean, look, an e-commerce platform for India, sure, it's nice that we have one or that if we create our own next uh, health platform. And all these things are, are important, but these will be fueled by capital that's coming from somewhere or the other, not just necessarily Indian, uh, Indian capital. But I think if we're really talking about pure acceleration in tech for the future, um, I think it's going to be more than just a, a shift in sentiment away from China. It's going to require a proactive uh, approach from bodies in India. And I think you have many of the ingredients with capital and entrepreneurs, but I think that, that buy-in on a, on a government level for figuring out how to accelerate that and, and provide the right in background and infrastructure and, and setup for it will, will make a big difference. So, um, but in, until then, look, I'm hopeful that other capital comes in if Chinese capital dries up, which it should, and unfortunately now I've been here long enough and I'm old enough, I've seen enough cycles that I appreciate that when one thing goes, another thing comes, and so I'm not that worried about it from our sustenance standpoint. But for us to grow and take advantage, I think a few more things uh, are going to be required. Sure. Manish, there I is some... Jump in. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, please proceed. No, 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 go ahead. Last time I, <laughs> I went ahead first. You go ahead this time. So, uh, you know, uh, I, I'm hoping that the problems go away, right? Uh, geopolitical problems uh, are not good for business in general. Uh, mm. I, I'd hope that things, things get sorted. Yes. I would have loved to collaborate with Chinese investors. I, I have been, I've had good experience, a lot of learning. I, you know, we, we, we have a little bit to learn before we start performing. And mm. like Sandeep said, you know, uh, there's a long way to go. Uh, this is not necessarily our moment to fill in a gap. This is, this is our moment to realize that we haven't really done enough in India. We need to do a lot more innovation. Uh, I do believe that some of the unique to India solutions can, can be meaningful for countries, uh, other countries which have equally low G, uh, per capita GDP, like Africa and, and some of the other countries in the, in the region. Uh, but but uh, but in terms of innovation, we we have uh, some ground to cover and, and a lot to learn. Sure. No, I was just going to add to that and say, look, um, I agree with you, Anand. I don't. I think any kind of border tensions or geopolitical issues are not good for the economy yeah. and for new businesses or entrepreneurship in general. So we should all wish to go away over time, and I'm optimistic they will. Having said that, I think that, you know, now the world at large knows that India represents a huge opportunity, that the VC ecosystem is robust. The fact that entrepreneurs through the ups and downs, you know, the highs of 2015, the lows after that, the COVID crisis have become really seasoned, mature, grounded and prudent. 
And because of that, I think good quality companies attract capital from everywhere. There are US investors that I'm seeing coming into our portfolio companies, a whole bunch of European investors coming into our companies, Korean investors coming into our companies. So I don't think that one country pulling back a little bit will really affect us negatively, if as long as we are building solid path breaking and lasting businesses. So uh, I know I, I'm, I remain very optimistic and I also remain optimistic that this this sort of position we are in is temporary, it will go away. And in the meantime, we'll just keep growing for the better. Sure. Hey, Manish, what do you think? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah. I think, uh, I actually think, uh, you know, and I, I have to tell you a little anecdote to answer that question. When COVID uh, struck, probably in March, April, I was actually fairly depressed. I said, oh man, what to do? Not to, can't go to office, can't travel, can't meet entrepreneurs, what to do? And my wife said that this could potentially be the best thing that could happen to you. I said, what? I didn't realize it at that time. But I'm as time is going by, I'm realizing that actually, indeed, this is an opportunity, not a threat in some sense. Mm -hmm. Obviously, changes come and we need to take advantage of that. But there are multiple things that have happened. I think this is the best, as I've said in many times, COVID is probably the best freemium opportunity uh, that any business could have launched for an online consumer uh, business, right? People are trying all kinds of things. People are coming online. Uh, people are uh, people have unlocked many more hours in their day. They are working from home. They are spending uh, time with their family, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, there are obviously, if you get stuck in the past and don't change, then there is a problem. But if you are willing to move with times and see, all of our companies have done something fundamentally different in some cases and fundamentally more in some other cases where the uh, uh, trend was supporting. So overall, I just feel that this is a great for entrepreneurs and investors like us to really, really, and as a nation, actually in India, I think uh, we are well poised to actually take, 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 uh, take uh, advantage of the situation we are in and uh, totally agree with you that uh, uh, the geopolitical tension is never, never good for the business. So I hope it goes away and we can partner with China rather than uh, take advantage of uh, uh, the anti-China sentiment. Uh, overall, I just think that it's a great time to be an entrepreneur uh, and uh, therefore a great time to be an investor as well. 